Todd Sadowski caught up with some of them out at Shea. It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. This is amazing. I can't believe it. We're in March and it's 85 degrees out, little breeze. Great baseball weather. It's the best, man. The Phillies opened their season on the hottest March day in New York history. And besides the temperature gauge, it was a typical opening day. There was the pregame meal, batting practice, pitchers getting loose, even the waves swept through Shea. And of course, there was a lot of talk about the Phillies' chances this year. A new season brings new hope for the Phillies. The team was one of the bigger surprises in the second half of 97, and Phillies fans hope that success spills over into 98. I'm optimistic as far as seeing some progress, maybe 500. Uh, you know, I think we're looking more towards the future next year, the year after. They got, they got a chance. In 93, nobody picked them to do anything. Same kind of team this year. The Phil's pitching staff made progress, shutting out the Mets for 13 innings. But the offense was anemic, laying 14 goose eggs on the scoreboard. The longest scoreless opening day game in history ended when the Mets' Alberto Castillo singled in Brian McRae in the bottom of the 14th. Yeah, we didn't hit a lot, but we did have chances to score. Um, you know, and you know, when you don't hit a lot, you, you have to capitalize on, on something, and we didn't. One of the things you're proud of as a starting pitcher is the team's record when you pitch. And uh, to not get a win today was disappointing. But um, again, we, we played a great game today. We just, uh, we were one out short. Opening day represents the return of baseball. Fortunately for the Phils, it still counts as just one game in the standings. Reporting from Shea Stadium in New York, I'm Todd Sadowski for iWatch 13 Sports. Well, Marion is open strong. Finding financial freedom with Jonathan Pond is made possible by T. Rowe Price Associates. For over 50 years, T. Rowe Price has provided investment services, including no-load mutual funds, discount brokerage, and retirement plan services for individuals and corporations. T. Rowe Price. Invest with confidence. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Pond. Hello, welcome to Finding Financial Freedom. Uh, let, me be, let me begin by asking, uh, how many of you think you've achieved financial freedom? <laughs> well, <laughs> not too many hands have gone up. That, that doesn't surprise me. But that doesn't mean it's an impossible goal. In fact, during the course of this evening, I'm going to reveal 21 steps you can take to achieve financial security by the 21st century. And of course, that's just a few years away. Before we get into the tips, however, let me start with a surefire way to achieve financial freedom. Indeed, to, I think, to achieve financial riches beyond your wildest imagination. And how do you do that? Never take financial responsibility for anything that eats. <laughs> I mean, you think about it, uh, pets, spouses, Children are real financial drains. Uh, the only problem is that for many of us, this is not a realistic option. So what else can you do? Well, I've thought about it long and hard. And I've, it, to paraphrase uh, David Letterman, I've come up with my top seven ways to prepare for a secure financial future. Let's look at them. <laughs> Tip number seven. Save regularly by saving automatically. Tip number six, simplify your financial life. Number five, plan for retirement every day. Number four, buy a home so you can be mortgage free by the time you retire. Tip number three, close gaps in your insurance coverage. And tip number two, decide what you want your money to do for you. And finally, tip number one, live beneath your means. Now, how many of you wish you could save more? Uh, the way I see it, there are only four ways legally to accumulate wealth. You can marry it, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Now, you can inherit it. But I, I advise you that I have been going around the country telling your parents to spend it all before they die. And believe me, they like that idea. Oh, you can win the lottery. There's a fat chance of that, right? I mean, lotteries are nothing more than a tax on the naive. 
Finally, the only way I can see that you can accumulate the money you need to achieve financial security is to live beneath your means. In other words, spend less than you earn. And the best place to start is with the big ticket items that we Americans love to spend the biggest part of our paychecks on. To cite a couple of them, there's the home and certainly cars. Let's take a look. It's hard for me to believe, but Americans have long had a love affair with their cars. But unlike fine wine, cars don't improve with age. Many Americans like to lease or trade their cars every three years or so. Let's see how much money that could set them back. Well, sir, you have a minute. Hi, I'm Jonathan Pond. Cesar Prado. Nice to see you. Let's cut to the chase here. What, what does one of these babies cost? Which one? Uh, I like the Seville. Like well, the Seville. the Seville you can buy now or you can lease. Which one would you like to do? Well, let, let, give me the price, first of all. Well, you can buy this car probably for $38,500, somewhere in that, uh, okay. in that vicinity, depending on the equipment. All right, if I wanted to lease it over a three-year period, say I want to get rid of it after three years. Cadillac is running a special on Seville's now, uh, 499 down and $4.99 mm -hmm. a month plus tax. Okay. That's the advertised special that GM is running. That's about $18,000. Yeah, so give or the, take a few the, dollars. For about 36 months. What if I wanted to finance it over three years? If you years? finance the same amount for mm -hmm. three years, it would be 36 payments at $1,135 a month. Okay. So it gives me a lot of choices. It gives you a lot of choices. You can finance it longer than that if you like. Okay. Great, thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate it. Nice okay, meeting. Bye. Now, you may not be in the market for such a high-priced car, but before you go out and make any deal, I'd like to share with you a study that I recently conducted about the costs of car ownership. I compared the cost of buying a new car and trading it every three years with the cost of buying a new car and then holding on to it for 10 years. I then calculated the difference between those two approaches over a person's entire working life, about 40 years. The results are astonishing. Based on a car that now costs $18,000, a person who trades his or her car every 10 years saves $385,000. That's enough money to retire five years earlier than the person who trades or leases a car every three years. By the way, my calculations include enough money to pay for some expensive repairs for the cars owned for 10 years. Now you may think that driving around in an old car is good in theory, but in, you may real, you, you might think that people who drive around in old cars are just above the poverty. What's going on? Paul, is that you? Hi. Paul Kangas of the Nightly Business Report. Quite a machine here. Very dependable. What, what is it? Very old. 1983 Caprice Classic Chevrolet, about 88,000. Is it? I love wonderful it. Wonderful car? It's yeah. been a wonderful car. Now, why, why would a person of your stature want to drive around in an old car? Well, first of all, I don't have to worry about theft. Okay. It's very dependable. Uh, the car does not know what collision insurance is. <laughs> and uh, not only that, but uh, every 10 days, I double its value when I fill it with gas. <laughs> well, I, I think if somebody like Paul Kangas is driving around in a 13-year-old car, I would say my case is closed. Make that 12. <laughs> <laughs> Cars always get a visceral response out of everyone. Hands were going up. Uh, I, I'm sure you probably disagree with what we've said. Well, I have a question for you. I understand that you save money by holding a car for 10 years because cars don't depreciate very much, but couldn't you realize the same or better savings by buying a used car and holding it for a shorter period of time? Uh, you, you can. You, uh, the, the key is holding on to the car. Now, I studied recently hold, buying a car after four years mm -hmm. and holding, it on, holding on to it until eight years. And you can achieve just about the same savings. So yes, you can buy a used car. I, I prefer used cars myself. Would you hold on to that? Thank you very much. Is that money in there? <laughs> uh, the, 
the, the key thing with cars is, is holding on to them for, for enough time because uh, what we get into a problem with is just trading them too frequently or leasing them. And that is just a huge financial drain. So newer used is fine. Let's move on to tip number two. Decide what you want your money to do for you. You know, everyone, if you're embarking on a long journey, will need a road map, or I, I guess men don't. Uh, perhaps they should, but, but uh, uh, it's the same with our, our financial life. We all have certain goals in life, and they're fairly predictable, but it's important to keep them in mind. Let's look at the typical goals for working age people. First is certainly buying a house, and next is paying for the kids' college education. And finally, and, and really, the, the house and the college education are practice for the uh, big kahuna, which is funding a financially comfortable retirement. Now, for retired people, there are somewhat different goals. First, you want to keep up with inflation without running out of money. This is a real challenge for retirees, as we'll see shortly. And a second goal, and I, I, quite frankly, it escapes me why any retiree would want to do this, but they want to pass on an inheritance. I'm a big fan of spending it all, I think. Another situation with respect to setting goals, and that is I, I encourage you to sit down with your spouse or partner about once a year to discuss where you stand financially and what you want to achieve. You know, the more communication you have, the less likely you are to start arguments with your spouse. I mean, the fact is we all argue about money. Show me a married couple who's never had an argument about money. I'll show you a couple on the way to their own wedding reception. Uh, it's, it's, it's really natural, I think, that this is going to happen in a, in a, a relationship because it, it's, isn't it interesting that spenders tend to hook up with savers? Yeah. Right? Who, who's, who's the spender here? Is, you're the spender? Okay. You, you agree with that? Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. You, you, it's got to be that way. I mean, you can't have two savers marrying. Uh, that's like two actuaries marrying, or, or two, two spenders marrying would be financial Armageddon. But the more you talk about it, the better off you are. Tip number three, close gaps in your insurance coverage. You know, a single gap in insurance, an uninsured loss, could wipe out years, if not decades, of savings. So I'd like to point out common gaps in insurance coverage right now. First is disability insurance. By all means, every working person needs disability insurance. And by the way, if you have it through your employer, you might want to reimburse your employer for your disability insurance premium. That sounds crazy, but if you do so, any disability payments you receive will be tax-free. And I think that's a big advantage. Uh, next is renter's insurance. Three out of four renters in this country don't have insurance. It's inexpensive and it's easy to obtain. You need it. Next is umbrella liability insurance. And this is insurance that picks up where your homeowner's or renter's insurance and automobile insurance leaves off. It's inexpensive and it's crucial in this day and age where one out of 17 people I've heard get sued each year. And finally, replacement cost coverage. This is a nice thing to add to your homeowner's or renter's insurance. And what this does, it pays to replace any items that are lost or stolen new rather than at depreciated cost. And I think that's an important uh, feature to add to your insurance, and it doesn't cost very much. Let's move on to tip number four. Buy a home so you can be mortgage-free by the time you retire. You know, a home is still the single best investment you'll ever make. Don't wait. I see so many people waiting for interest rates to drop or for housing prices to drop. These people are going to be permanent renters. Get into a house sooner rather than later. If you do so, then you can start working to paying off your mortgage by the time you retire. Believe me, if you can be mortgage-free by the time you retire, it radically improves your retirement outlook. Let me give you an example. Somebody with a $100,000 mortgage, 25 years to pay it off. If you make an extra $100 a month payment against your mortgage, you'll pay it off 10 years sooner, just $100. I, I, I really think people should make extra payments against their mortgage to get the mortgage monkey off your back. Tip number five, plan for retirement every day. It's getting tougher and tougher for people to achieve a financially comfortable retirement. Let's look at why that is so. 
First of all, we have longer life expectancies. You know, the beginning of this century, no one lived to normal retirement age, so it wasn't a concern. Now, you will have to plan on a life expectancy of 95, at least plan financially for a life expectancy of 95. The second reason retirement is becoming more, com more complicated is inflation. Inflation at 3.5% per year, which I think is a reasonable number to use in making projections and what have you, inflation at 3.5% per year means your cost of living doubles every 20 years. That means the typical retiree is going to see his or her cost of living double or triple. And we're starting to see retirees running out of money. Next, companies are cutting back on retirement plans. I mean, this is a fact of life, and it's going to continue. So the burden is shifting from the employer to us. And finally, we have ambitious retirement aspirations. How many of you would like to retire early? OK. <laughs> that, that's pretty representative. The majority of people would like to retire early. My advice to you is to start planning now. It takes decades to be able to achieve a financially comfortable early retirement. You can't decide when you're 50 that you want to retire at 55. Now tip number six, simplify your financial life. I mean, our, our lives are complicated enough already. And what I'd like to do is go over a few suggestions for simplifying your financial life. First, reduce the number of investment and bank accounts. You need, you need, need no more than a couple of investment accounts and a couple of bank accounts. Next, you want to cut up some credit cards, right? Does anybody here have more than five credit cards? <laughs> Bad boy. Bad boy. Take the scissors to them. You need, you need two credit cards at most. Next, take an inventory of your household possessions. That way, if disaster strikes, at least you're going to be able to reproduce what you own so you're not going to haggle with the insurance company. And by the way, don't store the inventory in your house, OK? <laughs> and finally, set up a simple record keeping system, a system that will be useful to you. It doesn't need to be complicated, but one that will help you organize your records in the future. Now let's move on to tip number seven. Save regularly by saving automatically. I, I like to refer to this as better living through electronics. You know, if we never see the money, it's hard to spend it. And what I'd like to do now is give you the best places to put your savings. How to, once it's removed from your account, where should it go? The best, bar none, is a company retirement plan. If you have a 401k plan or a 403b plan at your place of work, this is a wonderful place to put it. It's the best place. Next best is a mutual fund or brokerage account. And finally, the third best is a credit union or bank savings account. The important thing is to get used to saving regularly. You know it can get addictive. And it's amazing how much regular savings will add up to. Let's look at simply saving an extra $50 a week, what that will amount to. In one year, just one year, you'll have $2,700. In 10 years, you'll have $40,000. But look at it, 30 years, just $50 a week will amount to $325,000. Now, I've given you a lot of suggestions on how to prepare for a secure financial future, but I'm sure some of you have questions about how to apply them. So let's see what's on your minds at this point. OK. Thank you. All right. OK. I was wondering which is more preferable, um, term insurance or cash value? Value. That's, that's the age-old <laughs> question. Uh, uh, term is, is useful if you are. Um, if you need pure insurance protection. Cash value is, is a savings vehicle. It tends to be a f pretty mediocre savings vehicle. And, and it's, uh, uh, it's one that if you need forced savings, it's OK, but you can, invest, you can get better returns on your money elsewhere. You, you know, one, one issue here when the term or cash value, one thing to remember is nothing in your financial life is either or. Nothing is either or. So uh, in, in many instances, part term and part cash value. But if you need a lot of insurance protection, term is the place to be. Okay. Now, it's one thing to cut down on your expenses. But it's equally important is knowing 
how to get your savings to grow. So when we come back, I'll be talking about what you need to know about investing wisely. The best investment you can make to ensure more quality programs like this and nightly business report is by making a contribution to your public television station. Take this opportunity to call in your pledge now. Hello, Jonathan here with some tips on how to invest wisely. But first, a word from T. Rowe Price on your investment in public television. Hello, my name is Jim Reapy, president of T. Rowe Price Investment Services. You know, achieving a secure financial future requires more than top performing investments. Investors also need balanced, candid information and the tools to make confident investment decisions. That's why we're pleased to sponsor this informative program. And we'd also like to thank you for your pledge to public television. Your investment will provide valuable dividends in the future. Welcome back to Finding Financial Freedom. I'm Jonathan Pond, and in this segment, I'll be talking about a subject that many of us would rather not think about, and that's investing. The fact is, if you don't invest, you really have very little chance of attaining many of your financial goals, and we'll see why in a few minutes. But first, let's continue on our journey through the 21 ways to attain financial security by the 21st century with a look at my second top seven list, this one on investing wisely. <laughs> Number 14, plan now to meet college expenses. Number 13, take advantage of tax-advantaged investments. Tip number 12, review and rebalance your investments periodically. Number 11, select good investments. Number 10, invest with balance. Number 9, take prudent risk. Number 8, learn how to invest wisely, just like the pros. And let's begin with that point. The fact is that investing, like the pros, is really not all that complicated. What I'd like you to do is lead through the investment process. And to start with that, let's take a little side trip to the place where many of the investment pros hang out every day. Well, here I am at the New York Stock Exchange, where hundreds of millions of shares of stock trade every day. Now, most of those trades are placed by professional money managers. They have millions of dollars at their disposal and they're backed by research staffs and computers. So does the little guy like you or me have any chance at all of making money against that kind of competition? Although stocks can go down in value, history shows that over the long run, the market beats out just about every other investment. The mistake many new investors make is thinking that they can make money simply by buying any stock and then just waiting for it to go up. Famed stock picker Elaine Garzarelli takes a different approach. She identifies sectors of the economy that should grow in the coming years and then looks for companies within them that should benefit. For the next five years, I think you have to be in, uh, in technology and capital spending related groups because I think that with the emerging markets and uh, the GDP uh, in those areas growing faster than in the United States, there's going to be a lot of demand by businesses for um, plan and equipment spending and robotics and all kinds of technologies and telephone systems. So that's really where the growth is going to be. But buying a stock is one thing. It's much tougher to decide when it's time to sell. Garzarelli says she bails out when you least expect, just when the company's doing great and Wall Street's analysts have fallen in love with the stock. In other words, if the consensus is too in love with that industry, you have to kind of realize that uh, when the earnings come out, they'll be disappointing, even by a penny, and the stock can drop 10, 15 percent in a day. So my work is really to try and figure out those areas where the consensus has fallen in, in love with the groups and to be careful about those. While the course of the economy and company profits are at the heart of Garzarelli's method, other Wall Streeters take a totally different approach. They look at charts of stock price patterns to tell whether it's time to buy or sell. That method is called technical analysis, and one of its leading proponents is Stan Weinstein. You can have two companies, both doing tremendously, but one has a good-looking chart and one has a horrid chart. 
the one with a good looking chart, and that's what life as well as the stock market is probabilities, is a far better probability of doing well. A perfect example, in 1995 we had a terrific stock market, but Chrysler, which is a wonderful company, had a poor chart and the stock went down irrespective. So it's a way of increasing your probabilities and putting the good odds in your favor. Okay. Weinstein says the small investor can use technical analysis to advantage, but he or she must be willing to put in at least an hour a week to study the charts. Now, if the intricacies of stock picking or timing make you queasy, you can still play the market by putting money into stock mutual funds. That way, you're leaving the stock buying and selling decisions to a professional manager. Just remember, for every Wall Street pro who's buying, there's another who's selling the same shares, and they both think they've made the right decision. <laughs> Investing's never a sure thing. I think one thing we can count on, however, is that there'll be a question about investing. Is there a question? Okay. Thank you. You said that stocks are better than other investments over the long run, but the last time I bought stock, the market dropped. Is there a way I can find out to get into the market when it's low and out of it when it's high? <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish there were. Uh, first of all, don't believe that market timing works. It doesn't. You cannot predict the market. You've got to be a long-term investor and be able to tolerate periodic declines in stock prices. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. If you look back since the mid-1920s, 70 years or so, there were about 850 months since the mid-1920s. And do you realize in just 30 of those months, over 98% of the gains in stocks have been earned in just 30 months out of over 800? And you know, most of those months were after the market had declined when all the scaredy cats got out. So you really need to be a long-term investor, and don't try to time the market. It doesn't work. OK, let's move on to tip number nine. Take prudent risk. You know, the biggest risk in investing is really taking no risk at all. There are two kinds of risk. You have the, the visible risk of losing money periodically, and that's what scares many of us. But you also have the invisible risk, and that's far more insidious. That's the invisible risk of losing ground to inflation. You know, you really need to beat inflation over the long run to achieve your financial dreams. Now, let's first look at the four major investment categories. First, stocks and stock mutual funds, bonds and bond mutual funds, real estate, and short-term investments. Stocks historically have proven to be a superior investment. As you'll see from this chart, over the past 20 years, stocks have beaten every other category measured here, government bonds, real estate, commodities, and gold. Now, for purposes of discussion over the next few minutes, I'm going to concentrate on stocks and bonds. That's where most of us invest our money. And I want to talk about how you can put together a portfolio that will stand by you in good times and bad. The next three tips, we'll talk about that. Tip number 10 is to invest with balance. There's, uh, it, it's so important to, to participate in a variety of investment sectors in proper proportions. So there first are two steps to investing with balance. The first step is to subtract your age from 110. And that's the percentage of your investment money that should be in stocks. How old are you? Uh, well, uh, the big 5-0. Join the crowd. <laughs> that's pretty easy math, too. That would mean if you're 50, subtract 50 from 110, you would want to have 60% approximately of your money in stocks and the rest, or 40% in this instance, in bonds. Pretty easy calculation. Step number two is to invest in all major stock and bond categories. Now the stock categories, and you're going to want to invest part of your money in each of these categories, that which is earmarked for stocks, growth stocks, income stocks, those are the stocks 
of companies that pay dividends. Small company stocks, a very volatile category, but historically for long-term investors, and we're all long-term investors, have done very well. And finally, international stocks. Everybody needs to invest in international stocks in some proportion. Also, the bond categories, three major categories, municipal bonds, U.S. government bonds, those are treasury bonds and Ginnie Mays, and finally, corporate bonds. So you need to invest in all major sectors. Tip number 11 is to select good investments. Now that goes without saying, but it has escaped many of us over our investing lifetimes. But it's fairly straightforward. I mean, stocks, you invest in stocks of companies that have good future prospects. Also, use some of your own expertise to, to buy stocks. You know, your expertise as a consumer or in your career I mean, you can really beat the daylights out of the Wall Street experts just by looking around and identifying good opportunities. Now, if you're investing in mutual funds, the key there is to invest in mutual funds that are consistently above average compared with other similar mutual funds in their category. But you know, one of the best ways to select good investments is to avoid making lousy investments. And let me give you my ideas of investment nevers. First, never invest in anything you don't understand. If somebody can't explain it to you in one sentence, don't invest in it. Never invest on the advice of someone you've never met. Now, I had somebody call me recently, wanted to be my neighborhood investment advisor, and he was 2,000 miles away. Don't invest quickly. You never need to invest in a worthwhile investment quickly. I can guarantee you, if somebody says you've got to invest your money within 24 hours, you can confidently assume 24 hours after that you've lost all your money. Never buy last month's or last year's hot performing stock or mutual fund. You know, some people just chase these things like lemmings and you're bound to be disappointed. And finally, never hold on to an investment for sentimental reasons. You know, I don't care, Uncle Joe went to his grave wanting you to hold on to that stock, and I'll tell you, the stock is a dog. But if you want to honor Uncle Joe's memory, hold on to one share, <laughs> but no more. Now, tip number 12 is to rebalance your investments periodically. Uh, if you follow what I've talked about so far about in allocating your investments, selecting good investments, you'll do quite well. But by rebalancing your investments, you're going to go from being a good investor to an excellent investor. The first thing you need to do is combine all of your investment accounts. You can't really look at how, where you stand by looking at each account separately. And then every six months or so, compare your investments to the target that you've established for yourself. Now let's take a look at how you would rebalance an investment portfolio. Uh, let's assume you've set a target of 50% stocks and 50% bonds. Okay, and six months or so later, you look at your portfolio, and it's now 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Stocks perhaps rose in value, bonds perhaps declined in value. What you do is rebalance. You sell enough stocks and buy enough bonds to get back to, to your target percentage. The thing about rebalancing is that it forces you to do the right thing. What does is, what is rebalancing force you to do? First of all, it says you sell stocks after they've risen in value. That's called selling high. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. It forces you to buy stocks after they've fallen in value. Buying low, right? You might want to write that down. It's an elusive concept. And that's the beauty of this. It also forces you to buy bonds when interest rates are high, which is when you want to buy bonds. What rebalancing does, by the way, is it forces you to do the opposite of what the experts are telling you to do. And believe me, you can go very far in your investing future by doing the opposite of what the people are telling you to do. Now, tip number 13, take advantage of tax-advantaged investments. You know, there are only two things in life are certain, they say, death and taxes, but at least death doesn't get worse every time the Congress convenes. <laughs> Think about it. Well, if the key to successful investing is beating inflation, one of the best ways to do it is to avoid 
paying taxes on the money along the way. So what I'd like to do now is to go over the various categories of tax advantage investments in order of preference. The best is an employer retirement savings plan. I mean, you, quite frankly, you've got to have cement between your ears if you don't participate in those. They're too good to pass up. You're sacrificing your financial future. The second best is a self-employed retirement plan. Now, if, even if you're moonlighting and you have income but you have a pension from your job, you can still set up a self-employed retirement plan, a, something like a KEO plan or a SEP plan, Simplified Employee Pension Plan. Third best is an IRA. I mean, whether deductible or not, you should be contributing to an IRA to take advantage of the tax-deferred buildup. Fourth best, buying and holding stock, individual stocks and real estate. A lot, we lose sight of that periodically. That's a tax-deferred investment. Because so long as you hold on to them, any increase in value is not subject to taxes until such time as you sell them. And finally, fifth best, municipal bonds and bond funds. These are tax-free investments. The interest is tax-free federally and may well be tax-free in the state in which you reside. Take advantage of tax advantage investments. Number 14, plan now to meet college expenses. Oh, I've got three kids under the age of nine. I looked at the projection of their college costs and I thought I was looking at the federal deficit. I mean, it was just awful. Now, one suggestion at the outset is, by all means, don't try to save every last cent. I mean, I mean you'll, you'll abandon it from the get-go. Try to save 30 or 40 percent of what it, you figure it's going to cost the, to educate the kids. If you can save that much, some of my acquaintances whose kids are in college have said you can make up the difference just having them out of the house. <laughs> but, but do try to put some money aside. I wouldn't put a lot of money in a kid's name. It could backfire on you. It could, it could mean you don't qualify for financial aid. Uh, it could, and this is a concern with my middle daughter, uh, five years old now, but, but uh, I, I would worry that she might run off with the money uh, in lieu of going to college. Now, one of the questions I'm most frequently asked is, how do I invest college savings? And it's not that complicated. If you have a preteen, you would invest college savings to emphasize long-term growth. You would invest the money in, primarily in stocks, just like you would retirement money. But as they become teenagers, as if you don't have enough problems with a teenager around the house, you need to gradually reduce your growth investments to emphasize short-term investments as the child nears college age, because you have less time to make up from any losses. That's as simple as that. Now that we've covered my seven tips to investing wisely, a Professor Pond will be happy to entertain any questions on the subject that we have from the audience. Okay. Oh, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Jonathan, I've always been interested in investing in real estate. Do you have any tips for buying real estate now? I, I didn't talk about real estate, but real estate's a great way to create wealth. There's no question. If you can stomach being a landlord. <laughs> Uh, let, let, me, let me give you a rule of thumb that will avoid you overpaying for real estate, because that's the big problem, and a lot of first-time real estate investors do overpay. Never pay more than seven times annual rental for the property. Uh, now, that, that would mean if you have a property that, is, uh, that generates $10,000 a year in rent, you would only pay, or you would pay no more than seven times that or $70,000 for the property. Um, if you pay much more than that, you're, you're, uh, you're not going to have a very satisfactory investment. Okay? All right. You've okay. talked a little bit about uh, buying stocks and mutual funds. What about tips about buying bonds? Bonds. Well, bonds, I think, have a, a, an important role in the portfolio for many people. Uh, one thing to do is only buy a bond if you think you get a decent return, but also avoid junk bonds. Uh, you know, if you're buying individual bonds, you want to buy high-quality bonds. Municipals are often advantageous for many investors. The other thing you want to do is ladder your maturities. Don't buy a single maturity, because that, that puts too much risk in the portfolio if there's a major change in, in the uh, interest rate environment. 
So ladder the maturities. Rather than buying a five-year bond or a bunch of five-year bonds, buy a three, a five, and a seven-year bond, perhaps. Well, we've now covered two-thirds of my 21 ways to achieve financial security by the 21st century, but there are still some important matters that I will need to discuss that will help you and your loved ones find financial freedom. So please stay tuned to find out. If the financial information presented on this program is valuable to you, it's time to show your interest by doing your part to help this public television station. Make your pledge right now. Hello, Jonathan here with some tips on achieving financial well-being. But first, a word from T. Rowe Price on your role in the finances of public television. Hello, my name is Jim Reapy, president of T. Rowe Price Investment Services. You know, achieving a secure financial future requires more than top performing investments. Investors also need balanced, candid information and the tools to make confident investment decisions. That's why we're pleased to sponsor this informative program. And we'd also like to thank you for your pledge to public television. Your investment will provide valuable dividends in the future. Welcome back to Finding Financial Freedom. I'm Jonathan Pond, and in this segment, we'll be talking about how to assure lifetime financial well-being for you and your loved ones. Now, I know you're probably saying, well, why is he spending a third of this show on such a matter? If you follow my top seven ways to do this, I think you and your loved ones will save yourselves a lot of trouble. So what are my seven tips? Let's look at the list. Number 21, take control of your financial future. 20, teach your children about money. Tip number 19, make the most of your charitable giving. Number 18, consider trusts and other estate planning techniques. Number 17, prepare basic estate planning documents. 16, make sure your retirement years are financially comfortable. 15, manage your debt so that it doesn't manage you. You know, too many of us have too much debt. I'd like to give you an example of uh, someone who has $7,500 in credit card debt. Now, that, that, that may not be a lot. I, I uh, featured a couple on a, on a show not too many months ago that had $97,000 in credit card debt. Let's just look at a mere $7,500. Do you realize to pay off $7,500 in credit card debt in one year would require $5.50 an hour out of your pay? For someone making $35,000 a year, that would mean that person would have to work 20 minutes of each hour for a year to pay off that debt. You know, there are very few good reasons to borrow. You really only borrow to buy something that will benefit you in the future. Certainly, it's useful to borrow for a home. Home improvements make sense. If they're sensible home improvements, I'm talking about something that will add value to your house, not a swimming pool or a bocce ball court. <laughs> and finally, the, the last reason to borrow is to, to pay for a college education, because that's an important family goal, and it's one that will benefit the student in the future. Tip number 16. Make sure your retirement years are financially comfortable. Now, I'm directing these remarks to retired people and their children. And children of, of uh, elderly people, uh, remember this. Your parents probably tell you, we don't want to be a burden on you. Well, chances are they're going to be. <laughs> and there are some important matters to attend to with respect to senior citizens. First one is housing. You know, I wish they would pass a law in this country that would require anyone who reaches age 65 to discuss with their family members various housing options. 
because you and I both know what happens. When the nursing home decision has to be made, the poor children are put on a permanent guilt trip because, and how many people have heard these words, when it's ready to put mother, when it's time to put mother in a nursing home, she says, shoot me rather than put me in a nursing home. Discuss these matters sooner rather than later. Also, insurance. Make sure your parents, or if you're retired, make sure you keep and maintain the right kind of insurance. Same thing with health care. A lot of seniors are reticent to ask for the, the health care that they deserve. And sometimes a younger generation family member will have to intervene. And finally, look for situations where there might be money problems. A sudden change in spending habits, late filing of tax returns, late payment of bills or something like that. It may be an indication that, that a senior citizen is, is simply unable to maintain his or her day-to-day -day finances. A couple of other remarks for retired people. You, you have to continue saving until at least age 75. We talked about inflation. And the fact is, it's no longer sufficient just not to invade principle. You have to continue saving well into your retirement years. Also, there's a myth going around that retirees should invest differently from working age people. That's not the case. Retirees need to invest for a rising income and for growth to keep up with ever-increasing living costs. Let's move on to tip 17. Prepare basic estate planning documents. Now, I know it's difficult to contemplate our own mortality, although it would appear that, that that's a relatively sure thing eventually. So unless you absolutely detest your heirs, <laughs> think, consider these basic estate planning documents. First, a valid and up-to-date will. The vast majority of adults in this country don't even have a will. Next is a durable power of attorney. Now, a durable power of attorney allows you to designate in advance who you want to take care of you in the event you become incapacitated. If you don't have a durable power, Pond's law of incapacity takes effect. And what Pond's law of incapacity says is that if you become incapacitated and don't have a durable power of attorney, the courts have to decide who will take care of you. And according to my law, the courts will designate the one child you cannot trust to do so. <laughs> Next, a living will or health care proxy. And this states that under circumstances that you designate in advance, you don't want to be kept alive by artificial means, and most people should and want to have that. And finally is a letter of instructions. A letter of instructions is an informal document. You don't need an attorney to prepare it, which provides important information for family members upon your demise. So do consider basic estate planning documents. And the fact is many people can benefit from trusts and other estate planning techniques. That's tip number 18. You know, estate taxes kick in. The minimum estate tax rate is 37%. Now, you have to have a reasonably sizable estate to, to be socked with that tax, but more and more people are getting estates of that size. So if your estate is likely to be large enough, let me give you some estate planning techniques that will help you whittle down that money. First of all, it's a unified credit trust for married couples. This is incorporated in your will, and it allows each spouse to take maximum advantage of his or her credit against federal taxes. Otherwise, if you don't have this, the estate of the second spouse to die could be subject, get a load of this, to as much as $235,000 of estate taxes that could have been avoided by adding a couple of pages to each spouse's will. Also, life insurance trusts. A life insurance trust allows you to put the life insurance policy into the trust and the benefits will never be subject to estate taxes. And finally, annual gifts to family members. This is a great way for senior citizens with fairly large estates or younger people with quite large estates to whittle down their estate by giving $10,000 gifts to various family members. You can actually give them to anybody. If you'd like to give them to me, you could do that and they would be gratefully received. <laughs> Tip number 19, make the most of your charitable giving. You know, there are many advantages 
to charitable giving beyond the tax deductions and the good feelings that it gives us. There are some techniques that allow you literally to have your cake and eat it too. First, donating appreciated securities. If you do that rather than cash, you don't pay capital gains on the appreciation in the value of the securities you donate, and you get a tax deduction for the full value. Also, a pooled income fund or a charitable gift annuity. If you have five or $10,000 that you want to give away, you can give this to the organization, and you know what you get? You get a partial tax deduction for the money you donate, plus a lifetime income from the charity. It doesn't get much better than that. And if you have a larger amount of money to give away, charitable remainder trusts might be worth considering. So those are the, some of the things that you need to know to assure a lifetime of financial well-being for you and your loved ones. Now let's see what questions our audience has about those points. Okay. Ah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. Jonathan, I'm getting ready for retirement. What percentage of my money should I take for my nest egg? If you retire about normal retirement age, I would withdraw generally about 7% and no more than that. Uh, if you retire early, 6% would be a good amount. And, and the reason for that, it seems like a low number because you can make more than that on your money, but you've got to be able to continue saving in the future to be able to keep up with inflation. Other, ch other questions? Jonathan, you mentioned leaving a letter of instructions. What specific information should go in that letter? Well, it's, it's information that is immediately needed by surviving family members, such things as where important documents are located, uh, uh, where, what financial benefits are likely to be received, death benefits and what have you. Uh, you might include personal information, such as funeral wishes in there. It's a, it's a, very good way to organize your records as well. Now, one point, all too often, a letter of instructions is prepared and no one can find it. Well, what, what, you, what you need to do there to resolve that is very simple, as we have in the Pond family, and that's scotch tape your letter of instructions to the refrigerator door. <laughs> that way, everybody can find it. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Jonathan, what do you think about living trusts? Living trusts uh, are useful for some people. If you have uh, an estate that you're concerned will need professional management after your death, a living trust can accomplish that. It's also a way to avoid probate. Now, it doesn't save estate or income taxes. And I happen to think living trusts are oversold, but they are a useful vehicle for people, particularly if the state in which you live has a very onerous probate process then it might be worth, worth considering. Okay. Other questions? How can I find out more about the charitable giving funds that you talked about? Oh, if you want to give to a charitable gift annuity, a charitable remainder trust, believe me, the charities are going to come running. Uh, these, are, these are significant donations for, for charitable organizations, and uh, they're complex. So they are geared up to help you with the, uh, the complexities of tax filings and what have you. And, and you, you need call no further than the charity that you want to make the donation to. Chances are they'll show up at your doorstep with, with uh, advice and, and good advice, I might add. Now, as long as we're talking about leaving something for the next generation, there's something just as important as money, and that's knowledge. And that gets me into my next tip, teach your children about money. You may be surprised to find that your kids could become more receptive to that idea. And for one thing, you won't ever hear them complaining again that money is irrelevant. So how do you educate your kids about money? Well, let's take a look. If you think your kids will learn everything that they need to know in school, think again. Very few schools teach even the basics of money management. We've established over and over again that you make more money in stocks than you do in bonds, right? That's why these kids are attending money management camp at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach, Florida. In a week-long session, these kids learn such things as the difference between stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. When the week is over, 
Each camper is sent on a field trip to a local broker and given $100 to invest. In fact, after visiting this camp, I'm convinced these kids know more about money management than most adults. I'm going to tell my parents to get money out of the bank because I know that there are so many things that you can do with your money that is a lot better than those puny interest rates that these banks and the Federal Reserve and such are giving us. There is a safe way to invest in treasuries and stuff that you don't always have to gamble with the money that you don't want to lose. I like to tell my parents to um, look into more international stocks because um, I think that's a good part of your portfolio that you need to have. But you don't have to send your children to money management camp to help them learn about money. There's so many things you can do as parents or grandparents at home to make kids financially literate. For example, for very young children, you can use the allowance to teach them about money. Encourage them to divide the allowance into three equal portions. The first third would be for immediate spending. They can spend the money on anything they wish. The second third would be for short-term saving. In this instance, you might encourage a child, for example, rather than buy the eight crayon box this week, to save up their allowance over a few weeks so they can buy the 64 crayon box. And finally, the last third involves long-term saving. Here, they would put their money into a savings or investment account so that over the years, they can watch their money grow with dividend and interest income. We're going to open accounts. Now, not everybody's going to open an account today, but everyone should make an investment decision today. Another thing, don't be afraid to talk about money matters in front of your kids. Money Camp instructor Susan Bradley says it's surprising how much financial literacy even small children can acquire just by listening to their parents. A 10-year-old was telling us how some people, when they go into bankruptcy, hide their assets. They, he used the term, strip the corporation of assets and bought a lot of houses in his girlfriend's name, and then he declared bankruptcy, and that way he held his How does a 10-year-old know that? They know that because the family talks about it, and other kids know about their family business, if it's real estate or if it's oil. One final suggestion. I think we all agree on the importance of contributing to charity. And you can teach your children about charity by encouraging them to set aside part of their money for a charitable donation. Let them make the charitable donation in their own name so that they can enjoy the good feeling that comes from helping others. <laughs> Finally, there's tip number 21. Take control of your financial future. I think I've shown that it's not that complicated. And don't let anyone try to convince you otherwise. You know, there's a lot of good information out there. And we've covered a lot more than you can do. But I'd like you to identify a few important things to do to start and start doing them now. Soon you'll be well on your way to finding financial freedom. And here's something to look forward to. If you can take control of your financial future, do it now you'll be able to retire rich and die destitute. Now that's good financial planning. <laughs> to our studio audience, thank you very much for attending. And to you, our television audience, I appreciate it. Best wishes for a successful financial future. Thank you. Finding Financial Freedom with Jonathan Pond was underwritten by T. Rowe Price Associates an investment management firm providing no-load mutual funds, discount brokerage, and retirement plan services. T. Rowe Price is committed to helping independent investors make informed decisions and achieve their financial goals. T. Rowe Price, invest with confidence. You're welcome. You're going to send 10,000 bucks to your... Uh, you're going to send 10,000 bucks to your for your grandparents. Thank you for coming. Of course you can, yeah. There. yeah. That's right, you sure do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Good luck. Good luck. Well, what are you going to do? You figured out what you're going to do? Save money? Yeah. There's a big difference between saving and investing. You, you know, you got to save it first, and then you got to invest it.